So, I don't know, it's a matter of perspective. I, I do get excited about data, but when I look at what Tim does to make the thing behave and actually have rubber hitting the road, I'm, I'm really impressed with that. So I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to compliment what he's doing. And um, one of the things that he does from that is um, put out a CSV file. And that CSV file has the data set uh, for each of those different exchanges and the um, uh, pairs with all the depth of the order book. And we um, he's run that for a period of time, accumulated a historical data set. So that's what I take in and try to make any sense of it that I can. So I'll be looking for patterns, looking for things that we can uh, base algorithmic trades on. And the beauty of this whole operation is that the act of trying to make money is actually helping to smooth or will be helping to smooth the irregularities in the price. And it's so extremely volatile right now that that's a determinant to people's acceptance of these cryptocurrencies. So the very act of everybody just piling on and trying to figure out how to make sense of it and, and take advantage of the exaggerated uh, pricing uh, will help Bitcoin. And it's fun in the process. So it's like this is a total field day to get, get going on this. Uh, so why focus on price rather than the pipes? Typically, um, uh, the, the pipe stuff is really beyond me. I am, uh, I do R, and I love to do data science, and that's where my head is. And you know, I attend the um, uh, you know um, Bitcore and look at all that, and uh, that's all terrific. And I want to uh, understand that as well as I can. But the part that I deep dive on is everything pertaining to prices. So price volatility. Um, is is where my head is, and I want to smooth that out. And so, as I see it, that's where the opportunities are for all these things like products, services, uh, trading, um, and uh, arbing, and uh, coins. Every one of those things uh, can benefit the uh, more uh, reliably you can figure out when uh, the market uh, is out of whack and needs to be whacked or so uh, let me make a comment, too, on my use of R. So I'm interested, how many people in here um, use R or, or have used it? So I'd say that's, that's like, what, one in five people. So it's a pretty small proportion of, of people. How many use Python, for instance? I'll be interested in that. So that's a little, maybe a little better, but not, um, not that much, too. So let me give a little background on R, um, just to put it in perspective. I'll be showing a little bit of R code and showing some of the capabilities of it. And Tom, so before you go closer, a little background about yourself and how you got into it. Oh, yeah. So um, actually, I've always been interested in oddball valuation, you know, stuff like trying to figure out. Uh, what I was particularly interested in was the valuation of human capital. And so that's what I did my PhD on. And um, it's the only thing that doesn't show up on a balance sheet or income statement or uh, cash flow, and yet it's what really creates value in, in, a, um, in a company. And so the, it has all kinds of issues about it. It's got econometric issues, like can you tease out what the um, uh, contribution is as it affects uh, bottom line can you um, can you model that because um, same person in a different setting contributes differently so so there's a lot of messiness to that whole thing so I rolled up my sleeves and at Stanford I did it in uh, uh, engineering department um, business statistics economics education I, I I just absorbed all that stuff, so I was going between silos, and so it's like this whole thing with Bitcoin, and then I had gone out uh, to do <clears throat> consulting and uh, fiat currency trading and that kind of thing. But with the advent of the, um, actually the Dodd-Frank law, 
which uh, increased the capital threshold to be on the order of $10 million in order to do uh, currency trading uh, activity, uh, which was more capital than I had with my uh, business partner. And so uh, that gave rise to the thing of, okay, I need to regroup and go out for institutional funding. And then I got turned on to Bitcoin and got into um, what Tim was commenting about, about nobody has a track record there. And so this is like a, a tremendous opportunity to jump in and, and um, you know, figure it out and be on the ground floor. So I think it's an exciting time and if people in here respond on, on this, I'd love to, to work with you and explore that more. Um, so that's, that's why I'm in the game here and um, I started using R actually because of the packages that it has and the statistics and machine learning that it has. Uh, but then uh, I really don't uh, like the uh, uh, quantitative finance uh, models that are typically used, the GARCH and these other ones, all are based on assumptions that I don't think are appropriate at all for, um, for the way the market behaves. So that's led me into writing my own uh, algorithms and, uh, and I am still able to use R to write all that script and um, it's just uh, continued uh, being a plenty uh, good enough choice of language that, that I haven't actually learned Python or anything else. I, I, I just stick with the R, so uh, that's that's a shortcoming, but that's my that's what I'm sticking with. So, um, so um, I've developed, by the way, trading systems in R that actually are black boxes and uh, work with an API feed and uh, no, um, you know, human intervention except for in terror to go shut the damn thing off if it's got it wrong. <laughs> um, and, um, and so, the, uh, so R can be used for that. I also I don't know anything about uh, uh, HTML or HTTP, all those things, but I'm able to put up a website using R too. So I'll show you a demo about that briefly. <laughs> so, um, uh, so okay. Um, another thing about R is that it's got um, 5,800 different packages that have. Our, our statistical and machine learning are uh, really quite disciplined ones. They're, they're well written because they come from um, universities. There's a big base of it and that helps account for why R is uh, essentially the most widely distributed um, and used um, software for statistics and, uh, and machine learning. Uh, and it's displaced um, uh, MATLAB and SAS as the top dogs in it, though those are terrific and serve certain communities really well. Um, so it's got 120,000 functions that are out there. Um, it's got a, a base of people throughout the world that uh, can just about answer any question, so that's definitely a, a strength of it. Um, it's very fast on uh, uh, vectors and uh, matrix algebra and with these big data sets that you get with uh, the CSV files. I mean, not big relative to um, the uh, big data scale, but still they're they're large. It calculates it very quickly. So I mean, the platform's stable and it hasn't forked with different versions of it. It's pretty consistent. The drawbacks are that it's single threaded and everything operates in memory and that the development of it is done in silos that are based on the model of the way um, the universities operate rather than the way system developers operate where there's a shared thing with the GitHub that uh, gets better, faster results. That's why Python has come up so much faster uh, and it is a, an extraordinary uh, capability, but still R uh, has this established base and I think it, it's doing just fine. Okay, so Let's get into this thing about the volatility of Bitcoin. So we know it's really volatile. Uh, how does it compare, for instance, with the Euro-US dollar, okay? Because there were some 
um, you know, white knuckle points in the yes. What? What's the Euro-USO? Okay, so um, in the European Union, they agreed on one um, unit of currency that they all use, whether you're in Germany or in France or Spain or whatever, and it's called the Euro. And if you want to exchange that for a U.S. dollar, then this would be the price in U.S. dollars for oh, each each euro. Mm -hmm. So you can see it had a range there. This is over the past 10-year period. And uh, then let's look at gold. Now gold had a, a big run-up and then it uh, got slammed and faltered. And it looks vaguely similar to certain other currencies that we've, <laughs> yeah. we've seen. Okay. So how do they compare? And they're not putting them on one graph so that we, this is a, uh, an exponential vertical axis. Uh, you can see um, that the gold, that's that flat line going across the top where the black line just about perfectly matches it. And the uh, light uh, green or turquoise one down at the bottom, that's the euro relative to the dollar. And it's basically a flat line. And then what's this in the middle? That's Mount Gox and uh, Bitstamp. And that's just an outrageous slope on that sucker. That is awesome. I love it. And it has a lot of variability around it. So, I mean, look at the contrast. So you get an idea. This is just a payday here. I mean, we can do a lot of good and hopefully make a lot of money on this thing. Oh, you're getting excited right now. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go off, I'll be back. <laughs> okay. Well, it up, it's exponential. It's right. It's, it is that. And this is a supporting kind of a little viewpoint on it, too, which the uh, a yellow colored line here is the um, Mount Gox total volume per day, uh, where it's basically just the closing price at the end of the day. By the way, the whole concept of day doesn't make any sense on uh, currencies that go around the clock, uh, but it, there's an arbitrary point at which those are measured. And uh, if you take the number of uh, Bitcoin that were traded in that day on that exchange and multiply it by the price, that's what is represented for Mt. Cox by the yellow line and by Bitstamp for the turquoise line. And you can see that um, that Bitstamp has accelerated and caught up to where Mount Gox was. And then if you go across and you look at what that total dollar value is, the height of it up at the top is a hundred million dollars. Well, um, you know, in a day of trading in, a, in fiat currencies, uh, they trade um, essentially four trillion dollars each day. So the point is, this is like penny stocks here for the size of it, and that makes it something that's very vulnerable to manipulation and to, I mean, when the Winklevi come out with their exchange-traded fund, then that's going to be an enormous surge of new capital going into a very limited market. And um, I don't know, I don't think that line is going to bend down severely at that point. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, so this is, these are extraordinary times, and it's really cool. So anyway, the point is that the scale of this thing is really um, at the at the beginning of it, and uh, and we we want to get in on get our ducks lined up and get going on this, and get the regulators to figure out how to tax us and everything, and then let's let's get on it. But there's hmm. impediments to our capitalizing on it right now, but we'll work through that. Okay, so. Let's, let's talk about this issue of smoothing that uh, price. So here we have it displayed on a standard uh, metric on the uh, vertical axis, and the magenta line there is the bit stamp price of US, uh, in US dollars of the Bitcoin. And this was just a simple-minded little um, signal based on a moving average um, a short-term moving average compared with a longer-term moving average that would say when the short-term moving average, which is more responsive to change, dips down below the longer-term one, meaning the, uh, that it, in the short run looks like the market's turning down, then let's get out of the thing and just go to cash. So it, this isn't actively 
taking a short position, which is a bit of a challenge right now to make sure that you can participate in the downward turn. So let's just say we get out of it. Well, it looks like the behavior of that dark blue line is better. It's nicer. It, it doesn't have the uh, quite the severe downdrafts that it had, and it missed out on a little bit of the up, but it, that's perhaps a good transaction. So uh, if you could achieve that, that's good. There's a um, We'll get into some problems with that. It's not just that easy to step aside and, oh, I'll go to cash now, because that's where everybody goes to the exit, and all of a sudden there aren't uh, enough of those limit orders to absorb it. So it's just like you just uh, severely, uh, you know, um, uh, pay, you pay dearly for the fact that to get out of it, you're going to have to accept a much lower price than you wanted to. So, um, so here's the first R uh, graph, which is a pretty modest little one. I, I can't say I'm a good R uh, grapher here, but this is from the CSV file, and this was just a little snapshot showing what uh, the uh, bid ask uh, spread and the order book looks like for um, this was for Bitstamp for Bitcoin expressed in US dollars for the year 2014 uh, June 6th at uh, 741 uh, in the afternoon okay we're getting there what you're seeing on the right is a minute to minute um, um, snapshot of the order book as it's changing. So you can see the time going along. It's 4.20 in the afternoon on the 6th. And you can see on the bottom there that um, the price is uh, around 6.50 approximately. And you can... Okay. I'm sorry, why I don't understand why it's not wide, but the horizontal axis there is the price of the Bitcoin going from like 646 up to 680 or something, and on the vertical axis, that is the number of Bitcoins that you could buy at those, uh, uh, excuse me, that are being offered uh, uh, on the, the, the ask on the right and the bid on the left. And now it's getting active because it's at about 7 o'clock at night and the Asian market had just started at that point. What are the empty, are they all empty circles that are overlapping or are there empty circles and are there full, filled circles? Uh, they're empty circles and where they overlap sufficiently it looks like they're filled. So there are 100 data points on the uh, bid side and 100 on the ask side. And you can see that. 70 of them on the ask side. So this is a replay of, of data on June 6th? Yes, uh, so it's a snapshot in that CSV file, and all I did was take it and say, give me the um, increments and display them for 0.2 seconds each. So, so using R, there's a, there's a time column, and using R it animates the, the chart? Yes, like I, it calls it the system sleep, and I told it to sleep for 0.2 seconds, and then an increment to go through the next one. That's the code that's in the upper left side of this. How many people use R Studio? Have you ever? Or, so there are a few people. Okay, well that's the uh, upper left quadrant there is the code itself. The lower left is the console view of what that code produced. And then this is that display. Okay, so going back to the display. So that was the uh, Kind of gave you the idea of how that how animated this uh, order book is. All right, this slide I can't really account for completely. I found it on uh, highcharts.com, and um, there were a whole series of them that showed what happened on uh, June 12th and 13th, and these are in one hour. Uh, or, or two hours on uh, the, the bottom of it, and something big happened in each hour at 23 minutes after the hour. It looks like there was a, a big purchase that was being uh, submitted 
as this hourly interval order. <laughs> and look at the enormous, uh, that person was paying quite differently from what either other people are being paid for or what's being presented. It's, uh, our, I have no idea what's actually going on there. I'm just saying that there's a lot of funky stuff out there. <laughs> <laughs> what and that's, was this? I don't know. I tried to trace it down. It is presented through this thing called highcharts.com, but they didn't really reveal it. And they had a lot of other charts that were for the same period. This is for the uh, British pound versus the uh, uh, Bitcoin, and it's showing those same ones. The reason I included this was funkiness, that's a key theme, and that's something that, you know, Tim and I want to get into, is uh, tentatively putting in orders and seeing what the fills are, seeing what the slippage is, seeing uh, what kind of um, uh, magic is happening in, in the way they yeah. fill it. What's that matching engine like? One for me, uh, one for me, one for you, uh, you know, uh, kind of thing. We need to find that out because whatever that order book says is the number may not be uh, what you actually get. So, But the other thing I wanted to show is that the first one, the graph uh, just here, had to do with the uh, Bitcoin versus U.S. dollar, and um, but everything is attached to each other, so it will affect the relationship to each other uh, currency cost pair, and that's where the arbitrage comes in. It's where the anticipation of a ripple effect from something can set you up to capitalize on it. So uh, it's just a way of alerting ourselves to it. Um, so uh, this. Uh, this was where I was going to show what I showed you three quarters of a uh, while ago. Uh, and so that was running in the, uh, on an AWS instance um, using um, uh, R, RStudio and R. Okay, now we're going to get into uh, the arbitrage itself. Okay, so can we do any good with these um, exchanges that are out there? And, uh, in a simple-minded way, uh, I, I just went through looking for straightforward carving, okay? In other words, can we find somewhere where the bid price is above the ask price and just jump on it? I mean, is the, do such things exist? And so this little sample that we had um, uh, includes, uh, you can see in, under this base quotes column that it's... Um, got the BTC for the uh, Chinese yuan, the euro, the uh, and by the time you get down to the green one there, the Bitcoin USD, and you go across, you can see that the bid compared with the ask between Bitfinex and BTC EE um, uh, had a 1.89% um, apparent arbitrage opportunity there. So big exclamation mark in the note uh, column. Uh, and uh, same down for that same um, uh, exchange pair, but for the uh, uh, Litecoin versus US dollar, that looked like it was profitable. Oh, and I missed also the Litecoin and BTC uh, uh, in the reverse uh, exchange order had a little tiny net profit, 0.17%. But of course, all of that has all of these other issues behind it uh, that would account for why there would be a persistent distortion. So it isn't uh, as uh, good an opportunity as it may appear. And then this other snapshot is at 10 o'clock the next morning instead of 3 in the afternoon. And um, it shows a persistent uh, nearly 2% difference between them that still occurs. Okay, so that's just a straightforward one between um, different exchanges or, or broker dealers that uh, for a particular uh, pair. But the beauty of it is that if you take any given pair, uh, you may be able to find another two or three or more combinations together 
which give you an implied exchange rate on the one that you're wanting to compare it with, so that you can test all combinations of those and determine if there is a tri what's called a triangular arbitrage opportunity. And this uh, company named uh, Priceonomics had a little puzzle which said, can you find the best two currency plus Bitcoin arbitrage between three currencies in a live data stream? And they provided the live data stream. And so I submitted a solution uh, to it. And, um, and I'll show you that solution now. And um, so essentially, you can display the uh, bid and ask prices in a neat little matrix that allows you to say, OK, if you go from these currencies in the left-hand column there to the ones across the column heads, uh, then uh, it, this is interpreted as for uh, each U single US dollar, uh, you could get 0.78 euros for it. That would be the interpretation of it. Or if you were going from euros to US dollars, one euro would get you $1.28. So that's how that looks. And I mapped it in from a JSON um, uh, sequence or, or feed. And um, this is the R script for it. It's too small to read, probably, but it's not that much uh, script. And uh, everything's sort of self explanatory. If you just sit and read it, then you go, oh, I get it. They, uh, you know, oh, that one <laughs> is the way it is. For, most of us, for me at least, for the whole the whole thing. And uh, how long it took you to put together the script? Well, uh, I'll tell you, the script wasn't hard to put together, but putting it into the uh, shiny app that uh, puts it onto the um, uh, web, so that you can access it with a browser. That I ba beat my head against the wall for weeks on that, honestly. It, and then, then it all becomes self-evident and you go, oh, God, if I only knew that. So I, I tried to do it, I think, relatively early on with the um, uh, development of Shiny so that, uh, that I think they've got it down better and it can be done better. So then I, uh, what, uh, how many of you use um, a uh, cloud service like AWS? Okay, so okay, so that's like maybe a little bit more than half, maybe it looked like. So that's good. So just to, for those that don't, for AWS, if you buy things through Amazon, you already have an account, and then you just go into the uh, area for AWS and sign up for their EC2, which is their Elastic Computing uh, module. We, I didn't need more storage data. They uh, you, work out the private key for you. I needed a static IP and I could get that and then I configured this uh, Amazon uh, machine uh, instance that's medium size and then I had to configure it with Windows because one of my data sources I'm presently downloading as we're talking I have a live stream of 250 live data streams that I accumulate uh, all the time into uh, the data set that I use for uh, for fiat currency trading. So uh, this was cool because I didn't have to worry about whether the you know dog chewed through my cable at my home office or something like that. So I like it a lot better. And um, and uh, then I I have this little um, URL called Next One Up, and um, I will oh shoot now I'm going to show you and let me maybe. Hours again, trying to get me get this sorted out. But what I will do is show you, and you could probably do it on your cell phone too, and we'll blow it up probably because I don't know what the capacity is of it. But here, so now we're double click, we're launching next one up .com, and this is the app that I wrote in Shiny that took that little. Um, our code that I wrote and put it into a UI and into a server uh, configuration so that the UI is what's displaying it here and the server is what calculates it and so I choose the home currency and I can choose US dollars for instance uh, and uh, let's say I want to do a hundred dollars 
and then relying on this um, bogus synthetic uh, data feed that Priceonomics has made available, um, then I can just press uh, find the best one now, and the best one now based on U.S. dollars. And you can see that this is really old data because it's got. Can you make it bigger? I, I don't know that I can. Control plus. Control plus. Yeah. I can. Re I'll read it to you. Okay. Trade 100 U.S. dollars to 73.93 euros, and you you get, and then trade that to 0.94 Bitcoin, and then. When you come out at the other end and convert that back into dollars, you'll have ninety-eight dollars <laughs> and forty cents. <laughs> so it's not a good one. That's not what we. Well, hmm. that is the best way you can do it, with starting with U.S. dollars and ending with U.S. dollars, because it it just kind of mindlessly uh, powers through that, looking for the best combination, and it, it ain't there. There's nothing good from that way. But let's check and see. If our, we specified our home currency as uh, as euros, uh, that isn't good either. <laughs> it's minus two percent that we could lose there. Okay, well let's try it and see if we start off with Japanese yen. Yes, uh, there. According to this, if we uh, traded uh, 100 yen, which isn't a big commitment, we would <laughs> let's jack up the commitment so it's a, little, a little bit more reasonable. And so we got a hundred thousand. Now um, we could get uh, a nearly eight hundred euro, which translates to ten bitcoins at one hundred and four dollars, uh, and then back into an eight percent increase in it. So that that interactive capability it changes every second because the JSON feed uh, changes it so that it. Uh, is is all updated and all that all that's doing in R, huh? Uh, let's see, where are we? Oh, okay, that's bit. Yes, the reason is because this particular synthetic data feed, meaning it's fake data that uh, got uh, specified according to some rules that some coder wrote, was done clear back when. Bitcoin was around a hundred dollars, so you can almost tell that what month that must have been done, you know, if we were to go back. That's why. And it just never got updated because this isn't something that's driving very much. Do you have this attached to your 250 real sources or? Uh... No, no, no. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, I'm getting that from um, like one of the vendors is eSignal. They're an aggregator of, uh, of data. So I subscribe to a bunch of different um, um, indexes and exchanges to get the data there. And they give it out in a DDE link, which is just totally Neolithic, you know, it, it's uh, Paleolithic, it's really bad. And that's what's forced me to stay in the Windows environment in the uh, AWS uh, instance that I have. So you're working on attaching it to all the real data, or that's private, or uh... that's just private. Yeah, that's that's why. You, uh, so you have, have this real answer of the live best arbitrage pair right now somewhere hidden. No, no, I don't. I haven't actually hooked this up to that. I'm I'm writing the code now that is completely uh, capable of an ind indefinite number of exchanges and uh, and currency pairs, and those could be crypto or could be fiat, and that's what I'm working on with Tim, to take the CSV file that he throws at me with anything in it, and it just can accept it. Do you need help with that? You know, I, I would love, uh, you know, to co coordinate with people on different things. That, uh, that one... Um, there are aspects to it, yeah. I, I have to think, think it through. Um, uh, can I ask? So yeah, I just sure. want to say, you get an 8.39 crores gain. <clears throat> Sounds like a lot. But, uh, right. How much, because you're, you're taking a risk jumping through these two or three different currencies. And yes. It takes some time. Yes. So should it be 0.5 that it makes sense? Or should it be 2% before you know, trading makes sense? Like, yeah, I don't know. The answer to that is yeah, but it's got to be um, 
<laughs> this is, it's very difficult actually to write what the right rules should be on a synthetic data set so that it would come out with realistic numbers. And so they kind of got it generally close. But disregarding the synthetic data for a moment and answering the question like, okay, what should the targets be? We really need to find out like what the slippage is, what on earth the uh, difference is between that point in time where you commit to uh, that transaction and what goes on with the matching engine and the fills and all and of this fees. stuff. At any given point in time between banks, like in Singapore versus London, you'll find, surprisingly, that there are persistent differences between it. And those have to do with everything from creditworthiness or the clients that are being served at that point in time or the terms around the transaction. So it's just amazing to me, even in such a liquid market that you have those differentials. So I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised at all if there are substantial differences here. I think there was, you had made a comment about the BTCE having a, a requirement that is different. So there are all kinds of other factors that weigh into it. And, and uh, it's an empirical thing to just wade out into it tentatively and, and not mm. leap in because you'll be um, devoured. And I don't know whether that answered the question. This is. Yeah. yeah. Do you have any idea how long this kind of opportunity might last? Or does it evaporate in milliseconds <laughs> and uh, you know, minutes? Or? Yeah, I, I honestly don't. I, I'm not even sure that it, that it is. I mean, it, it's a potential opportunity because I'm not even sure. I, I gather there are people. There are people. Do people know of people making money in this right now with uh, arbitrage and so forth? Yeah. Uh, not at the level that you're doing it at, no. So mm -hmm. one of the things is that the persistent illiquidity discourages a lot of big money. Yeah. But, you know, I haven't seen anybody actually do the research. Mm -hmm. um, to Tim's point, a yeah. lot of people don't believe the data is good data. Yeah. So even if the data is bad data, um, you know, this is skepticism. But what you're showing me here, I mean, we've had people come to us say we want to do, you know, this type of arbitrage. But somebody's been, you know, <laughs> big enough to do it. This is amazing. I've never seen anyone. Like That's cool. Yeah. It, this is, you know, the platform that Tim's done. I, it's just like, whoa, this is way cool because there's a lot of discipline and knowledge that uh, you and your brother and the team with Phil that that have gone into this that is just really uh, uh, grounded. I mean, it's not just uh, casual stuff, like as Tim's describing. I, like if I could add, I mean, most of the traders I know who are doing um, automated trading on the APIs are really competing against pump and dumpers who yeah. are very predictable. You yeah. know, the first two weeks of a coin, it launches, yeah. so they buy into it. They can call a top, you know, yeah. once they see certain trade, you know, momentum slowing down. Currently, the state of the art is very primitive and yeah. very much against, you know, unsophisticated day traders. This is a, a different level of play. Mm -hmm. So, um, just as another key design concept that seems important to me is that uh, I'm picturing that each of these exchanges would you would have a uh, set of uh, accounts with holding these different currencies in them and that you uh, initiate a trade, even a triangular uh, arbitrage trade, where all of them are all initiated simultaneously. You don't have to go through the sequence of all of them and wait for 10 minutes or longer to have it verified. You just initiate them all at the same time so you capture that. and just provide for all of the uh, accounts to be able to absorb the transactions <laughs> as, you, as you do them. Um, but then you have to look at it as a management of a total portfolio rather than just this isolated trade. So that adds another layer of complexity on it that you have to be on top of. That, that, that interactive display where it presents to you the uh, current information and allows you to make a choice off of it is remarkable in the sense that actually that enables you to monitor and control a live trading process, for instance, because you could be 
uh, if you didn't trust your black box to be working and you just wanted to monitor it, it could display its present trading behavior and have a little panic button that you could press on and say, adios, I don't need that. I need to go back to sleep, you know. And, uh, and that, um, so I'm, I'm just uh, trying to justify why I still only know R. <laughs> okay, now we're into the final phase of what I would, shoot, man, I've been there. Here. Let me just power through this. Okay, this is the machine learning part, which is where it gets, uh, aside from the direct arbitrage or triangular arbitrage things, it's like, okay, let's press harder on this. Let's see if we can find patterns in what's going on uh, that, from which we can make predictions or make classifications. So by predictions, I mean uh, what kind of expected movement in the base price or uh, uh, might we be looking at or just the simple up or down as a classification thing okay so if that's our dependent variable then let's work out what how we can construct the rules that would guide us and in, into the, the, this and rely on the machine learning to do all the arithmetic for us so we need lots of raw current data and uh, coin trader is uh, set up to to provide that so just give me those big CSV mm -hmm. files um, and then first step that I do is to I, I characterize it as coding up the savvy features and by features I'm meaning the um, variables that um, uh, characterize or describe the uh, uh, this order book and uh, the patterns of activity, but by savvy, I mean ones that require domain knowledge of finance so that it isn't just like casual, uh, uh, irrelevant uh, uh, data points. I mean, I want the ones that are putting their finger right square on that's what you look for when you're looking at an order book. I want to see what the movement was. It, is it uh, like Tim was saying, being chewed out by a bunch of uh, people that are all moving in the same way. I want to know that when that happens, and so I want to create those variables that uh, define the edges that that uh, characterize that kind of movement, because that's a key kind of movement. Okay, and I want, and you just need to forget, well, at least in my view, all of the academic models and everything. Those are all based on assumptions, like uh, you know, auto regressive heteroscedastic uh, models is just like blah. It, it, they're based on assumptions that are about volatility, but the time periods that they're talking about uh, are not adaptive, so that they are a uh, very imprecise measure, and they persist in still writing uh, about them, and more power to them, keep them tied up, all the smart people working on the dumb stuff, uh, that's perfect. I mean, we can do money. <laughs> so, so um, and then use, uh, so instead I like to use nonlinear models, and my um, hero or model on use of these nonlinear methods is Peter Norvig at um, Google, and he's the uh, guru behind the, uh, the incredible capabilities in um, search and in uh, translate, you know, that uh, the translate thing with what is it, 33 languages or more that can go between Arabic and Hebrew or um, Sanskrit, that they don't even have to, uh, people that know the grammar in those different languages that they're doing the translation through. And the way they do it is through uh, very data intensive um, machine learning processes, and that's what I think needs to be applied here, and uh, not not try to uh, figure out what the curve should be, just go for it with the data. And one of the key principles the cardinal sin is overfitting, that's where you have this powerful algorithm that can sort out the relationship between the data and the dependent variable that you're trying to do, but uh, it's so powerful that if you let it go too far, it'll have figured out perfectly for that data set and you present a new data set to it and it falls flat on its face because it isn't uh, relevant. That's what's meant by the overfitting. 
and also this thing about the future. It's so easy to be misguided by thinking that you uh, have this historical data set that will inform you, but actually the historical data set has um, uh, elements of the future that have been um, interjected into it, such as data that is um, uh, has been corrected or updated so that at that point in time it wouldn't have been there, or there's a survivor um, bias where the fact that it's made it all the way through there would make you uh, miss out on the opportunities that uh, didn't make it all the way to the end that would have actually been more realistic. So steps <laughs> steps to build robust um, algorithms and rules so that you can do all this trading, hedging, and uh, uh, placing order limits. The way I started with it is just to write primitive uh, primitives that are these features. So for instance, mid quote is a concept that is really simple. It's whatever the uh, midpoint is between the best bid and ask. That's going to be a good reference point as a single number. Another is what's the difference between the two. That's the spread. And then another would be how far away, let's say, is the 25th um, uh, limit order from the mid quote and, uh, or the 50th quote away. Because that's a measure that is part of how steep that slope is. And you can just continue on down the list and produce a whole bunch of these primitives. Then you take those and you fully feature them by um, uh, going, by taking those and taking differences, uh, taking exponential moving averages, taking rate of changes, other things like that. Then that starts to tell you, oh, the market's going up or down or sideways. Those others were just snapshots of it. And then, then ideally, you take the data and you make a training set and you make a testing set. So you train the data on one set of data and then you test it against another set. Then, then when you find that, yeah, that didn't work very well, so you go back and you revise it and then you retest it and you keep doing that and doing that for a while and then you have a product which is the product of both of those two data sets and you still have to have a third data set which is the one that you've held back in reserve okay now you think you're good let's try it out you smart model let's see how smart you are and try it on data it's never seen and if it falls flat on its face then you've overfitted the thing and uh, you need to start over and you'll be able to salvage parts of what you have but the point is that you can't uh, uh, you, you have to have that kind of discipline. And then in answer to your question about like holding out every seventh one, if you randomly hold out ones, that's called bagging. And you, you can just uh, take random ones, come out with a model, and look for which variables show up in all of these different um, uh, analyses that have been done by different random sets. And you do the same thing also with the variables. You hold out different variables and see if some of them, when they are held out, they don't didn't make any difference. But some of them, when they're held out, it makes a big difference. That's called boosting. And then you do the boosting and the bagging <laughs> on these things. And it's just like you're shredding that data. You're just grinding out every bit of information you can possibly get from it. And that's what you use to find out what the most robust variables are. And and then you make then you you end up being able to tease out where where the strongest ones are. So the models include trees and random forests and uh, generalized linear models and uh, genetic uh, 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 alg uh, algorithms and um, uh, genetic programming. That, where the difference between those, the genetic programming is just completely free form. It'll just come up with all kinds of other things, whereas the genetic algorithms are exploring um, variations in um, the, like the parameters of a relatively static uh, model. So I'm just saying that you've got this whole um, inventory of methods that you can use, and then you can even take the best results of those and ensemble them together so that you end up with a voting kind of criteria like well with these 20 uh, mm -hmm. this is the way they say to go and um, and so then using the final code then that can be put back into the coin trader or uh, if we wanted to we could have it uh, be provided as a signal from the uh, outside source and then uh, just put that in and make trades off of it.